Okay, good evening, uh, everybody. Uh, welcome to this evening's program. Uh, it's a great pleasure for me to introduce uh, Professor Andreas uh, Herbert uh, Rothi. Uh, he's, uh, uh, you know, uh, very kind to have consented when he gave this lecture in Australian National University. I requested to, uh, you know, uh, have the same thing done at uh, Peninsula Foundation. Thank you, Andreas, for once again for agreeing to do this. Let me now introduce. Uh, uh, Professor Andreas to the audience, and we have uh, lots of uh, uh, you know members from the veteran community as well as academics in the audience will be continuing to be joining us. Uh, this lecture has generated a lot of interest. Uh, the lecture Clausewitz in the conflict of the 21st century is extremely particularly you know uh, interesting in the context of what's happening right now in Afghanistan, how the U.S. is withdrawn, how do we assess you know various aspects of political motive. With respect to the wars that it continues to have, uh, you know, for long periods, as much as 20 years. And today is the anniversary of the 9 11, is the 21st anniversary of the 9 11, uh, even the trigger of this entire global war on terrorism. Uh, let me introduce Professor Andreas uh, for the audience. He is an internationally recognized Clausewitz scholar, working as a senior lecturer at the faculty of Social and Cultural Studies at the University of Applied Sciences, uh, Fulda in Germany. He was also a private lecturer of political science at the Institute of Social Sciences, Humboldt University, Berlin, up to 2012. He's teaching and doing research in the field of violence and peace in world society. Uh, he was an associate of the Oxford Lever Helm Program, the changing character of war, which I followed very intimately as well, in 2004-2005 and was convener along with the uh, main uh, head of the program, Hugh Strach, uh, of the conference, Clausewitz in the 21st century. Uh, he was a visiting fellow at the London School of Economics and Political Science, Center for International Studies, etc. Uh, he is the author of a very fine book, Clausewitz Puzzle, The Political Theory of War, published by the Oxford University Press, and edited together with Hugh Strach, an anthology of Clausewitz in the 21st century. Uh, his latest book, together with Jan Willem Honig and Dan Moran, has just been published. Uh, it's called Clausewitz, The State and War. And of course, uh, he continues to write uh, you know, extensively in various international publications, give lectures all over. He held most recent lecture uh, you know, uh, in with the Australian National University on the 30th of this month, uh, last month. And uh, his latest book, written together with Ki Yong Son from uh, South Korea in Seoul, the book is called Order, Wars, and Floating Balance How the Rising Powers are Reshaping Our Worldview in the 21st Century. Now, without taking much of our time, uh, let me now invite uh, Professor Andreas. The floor is yours. And we are looking forward to listening. Your son, please. Really, many thanks for the invitation. It is my great honor to give a lecture in India, although due to the pandemic only online. Of course, a lecture on the 20th anniversary of 9-11 and shortly after the retreat of the US from Afghanistan could not omit these events. I'm also aware that there are necessarily conflicting assessments concerning both. And as I have noticed, you have had a workshop last Monday about the traumas of the victims of terror attacks. Yes. I won't like to appear as a sofa admiral and won't argue that the war in Afghanistan would have had a different outcome if the US and NATO would have relied on Clausewitz. So I'm concentrating on the ways of thinking with which we understand and would wage war. Concerning 9-11 and the outcome of the war in Afghanistan, I would like to highlight nevertheless two theses. First, 9-11 has shown vividly that we are really living in a globalized world in which there could be no Isles of peace and prosperity, whereas the rest of the world is characterized by a sea of violence and war. But it has to be seen in the future, 
whether terrorism will be viewed as a game changer for the 21st century or the rise of the other would be more important. The rise of the other, as Fares Zakaria has labeled, the rise of the newly industrialized nations. These have declined in the wake of European colonization and the subsequent American hegemony. But these are civilizations with a much longer memory than the rest. Second, the outcome of the war in Afghanistan should make it clear that politics, culture, and morality are at least equally important in comparison to Jeeves technology. I'm tempted as a Clausewitzian theoretician that they are more important in the long run. Perhaps if you have an immense advantage concerning technology, you may gain victory within a short time frame. But in a longer perspective, politics, morality, and culture are more counting, especially in a globalized world. In 1976, Harry Summers wrote in his book about the Vietnam War an analysis of the failures in Vietnam and invented a new interpretation of Clausewitz, which later became famous as Trinitarian warfare. In fact, he tried to understand the conduct of war by the US by using the concepts of Clausewitz. To date, it is not yet clear whether the end of the war in Afghanistan will also lead to a new interpretation of Clausewitz or a new paradigm of thinking concerning warfare in the 21st. Although there has been already a transformation of the interpretation of Clausewitz after the end of the Cold War, in my view, the outcome of the war in Afghanistan is confirming this change of paradigms of think thinking. Which are those? Perhaps you know the virtually known formula of war as a continuation of policy or politics by other means. But the change of interpretation is highlighting the wondrous trinity and the dialectics of defense and offense. One Clausewitz colleague even argued that the war in Afghanistan showed book six of On War about defense as a stronger form of war just in action. My lecture is divided into three parts. I will begin by looking at the history of some aspects of the Clausewitz interpretation. We'll proceed with some problems of method and will highlight the conceptualization of war in the Montes Trinity and the dialectics of defense and offense. And we'll finally end with two propositions concerning Clausewitz and the 21st. The attractiveness of Clausewitz is related to the myth that his work contains the secret of victory in war. I strongly reject this proposition. There is no single strategy that would enable victory to all, in all circumstances, as the theoreticians of fourth and fifth generation warfare seem to imply. I also reject the concept of the strategy bridge put forward by the late Colin Gray. Strategy is not the shortest way to connect politics and policy with the instrument they must use. Although Colin Gray only apparently is relying on Clausewitz, he is using a passage of the very early Clausewitz. Whereas in my interpretation, strategy is characterized by a floating balance of political purpose, means, and aims in warfare. Whereas Gray is concentrating on a direct relation between politics and the means and the thinking of a late clause with the aim in warfare is a mediating aspects between politics 
and the available, available, available means. There is no secret of victory to be found in on war. This would imply a single strategy which could be applied in all circumstances. But why was Clausewitz's work viewed as such a cookbook, a cook received? And what purpose it could have if it is not a cook received? The first question is related to the problem that on war is an unfinished book. which was not edited by Clausewitz himself, but by his, by his wife, Mary von Clausewitz. So in my view, uh, Clausewitz's uh, concept is, uh, Clausewitz's book is an unfinished symphony. Um, it is not a kind of book. book. Um, as I have tried to elaborate, if I find my manuscript. Lozovitz <laughs> uh, has uh, written a book which his wife has edited. I don't want to blame her uh, for the problems and the contradictions in his book. Um, but in fact, I have had the chance to uh, discover the original manuscript of chapter one together with uh, Paul Donker. And uh, it could be seen that uh, the famous formula of war as a continuation of policy by other means is just um, in the handwriting of Mary of Clausewitz, not of Clausewitz himself. This is important because the related text is not confirming uh, that policy that war is just or a mere continuation of policy, but it is written that uh, policy will be uh, of importance only insofar the exploding forces in war are allowing the primacy of policy. So we have the problem that we have at first uh, sight, just the formula of war as a continuation of politics or policy. But looking close, more closely, um, the final result of Clausewitz is the Trinity. The primary source of Clausewitz's fame was Helmut von Moltke, who studied at the Prussian War Academy when Clausewitz was administrative, administrative director and as a chief of the general staff of the Prussian army relied the success of the wars of German unification to the study of on war. To view on war as an unfinished symphony is also important concerning the problem of strategy. In most parts of on war, we find the attempt of Clausewitz to general, generalize the warfare exercised by Napoleon with the emphasis on the decisive battle. And the German generals in World War I relied on this battle-centric strategy with disastrous consequences. But concerning the political theory of war, Clausewitz took into account the failures and defeats of Napoleon. And these analyses were much more important for the development of Clausewitz thinking. The whole of book six is related to the Russian campaign of Napoleon and book eight to his final defeat at Waterloo. Battle-centric warfare is finally resulting in a reversal of Clausewitz's formula. 
as it could be already seen in social Darwinism and in the writings of General Ludendorff, who developed the concept of total war. Contrary to the far right, the far left in person of Mao Zedong has emphasized the primacy of policy and politics. I would not say that partisans always win the war. Although bearing Afghanistan in mind, it might seem so at present. But obviously, IS or Daesh was a different experience. To accept this conclusion does not legitimize the warfare of the Syrian army or that of the Russians. But IS was defeated in Syria and Iraq. So we should not create a new myth that partisans are always winning. As mentioned at the outset, the outcome of the war in Vietnam changed the interpretation of Clausewitz. After the war, Harry Summers interviewed an officer from Vietnam and said that the US Army has won in every battle. And the Vietnamese officer replied that this is irrelevant. Based on this experience, Summer developed the conception of Trinitarian warfare, which is only apparently supported by the text of Clausewitz. In fact, in his Trinity, Clausewitz is relating the three fundamental tendencies in war, violence, fight, and rationality to three institutions, the people, the army and its commander, and the government. But contrary to Clausewitz, Summers and later on Martin van Krefeld integrated these three tendencies into a fixed hierarchy. Whereas Clausewitz highlighted the floating balance of all three. Again, a war seemed to confirm this interpretation. Colin Powell in the Vietnam War, a young lieutenant appeared in front of the international press in the Iraq War 1991 with a copy of Clausewitz on war, seemingly to highlight, look, we have learned from the failure of Vietnam with Clausewitz. Based on his Clausewitz interpretation, he developed the Paul or Weinberger doctrine, which in my view is based on an over-rational interpretation of Clausewitz and of war in general. But perhaps the Paul doctrine need to be reviewed in light uh, of the events in Afghanistan. This over-rational interpretation has uh, been challenged by three problems. First, atomic bombs or war with weapons of mass destruction. How to conduct war with weapons of mass destruction? Because self-destruction as a result of such a war could not be a rational purpose. The rationality in a war with weapons of mass destruction is not the conduct of war, but to avoid it by all means. Second, the emergence of so-called new wars, which according to Herfried Münkler are characterized by the asymmetry of the fight, by private actors like warlords, child soldiers, and the markets of violence in which women, trucks, weapons, rare earths and blood diamonds are traded. The problem is that war can only be viewed as a continuation of policy or politics if there are policy and politics at all. So the new war seem apparently to question Clausewitz concepts. And finally, there's a great difference between state-to-state -state wars and those with partisans who tried to create a state. 
Whereas in state-to-state -state wars, both sides have to take into account their self-preservation. In revolutionary wars, to create a state, self-transgression is much more counting. As a result, already after 1991 and affirmed after 2001, the Clausewitz community and I myself developed an interpretation of Clausewitz, which highlights the centrality of the Wontus Trinity at the end of chapter instead of the formula and instead of Trinitarian warfare. The elements of both conceptions are more or less the same. But in Wontus Trinity, we find a floating balance of all three aspects, whereas Trinitarian warfare is bound to a strict and static hierarchy. <laughs> My own definition based on the Trinity. War is composed of violence force, the first tendency. Struggle or fight, the second. And the affiliation of the fighters to a greater community. In short, war is a violent struggle or fight of communities. Depending on the particular forms and variations of the applied violence, the struggle and the related community we get numerous combinations of these three tendencies in every war. Based on this interpretation, I have developed um, uh, this graphics in which you can see that we have three basic tendencies, violence force, warring community, and struggle fight. But it has important whether we have in uh, the related fight direct warfare or indirect warfare, Up, whether we are fighting against opposing builds or whether the goal is a phys physical destruction uh, of the enemy or the destruction of a political social community. It is different whether violence is applied by specialists or violence is applied by amateurs. Uh, and for example, it is important whether violence is uh, used as a means or violence is becoming independent from any purpose. These are just some examples of my um, graphics. Uh, but I think, in my view, based on this graphics, we can uh, analyze every and each war as long as it is still a war. If the community is a state, policy and politics have to be taken into account. But if it is a non-state non actor like the Taliban, like a tribe or a religious community, culture is more counting. However, in all these manifold cases, war is composed of violence or force, struggle, respectively fight, and the affiliation of those who fight to a greater community. I have started a short discussion within the worldwide Clausewitz community and got the following answers concerning the war in Afghanistan. One colleague has argued that the war in Afghanistan has been lost because of the lack of objective and the separation of the military operations from policy Strategy replaced politics, tactics replaced strategies. One other colleague has argued that the war in Afghanistan has been a perfect implementation of policy, but it shows the limits of what can be achieved by military means. 
interestingly, this is an, this was an active officer in the Dutch army. The war in Afghanistan did not result in the ambition transformation of the Afghan society, but it diminished terrorist attacks significantly, at least in the US. And finally, one argued that the wars in Afghanistan, Iraq, and Syria distracted the US from the real opponent, China and Russia, which were able to take advantage from the engagement of the US and the region of Middle East and North Africa. Let's now turn to the wars of the 21st century. War in Clausewitz Trinity is not only a chameleon, but a true hybrid. We have the conflicting tendencies of primordial violence like a blind natural force in connection with hatred and enmity. And on the other side, the subordinated nature of war, which makes it subject to pure reason. True hybridity is therefore related to these conflicting tendencies on one side, poor reason, and on the other side, a blind natural force. The traditional so uh, solution was that um, the floating balance of the three tendencies have been incorporated into hierarchies. Examples were Aron, Paré, and Howard. They have been emphasizing the primacy of rational policy. The German generals in World War I, they were relying on the ideology of the fight. And the new war scholars, uh, the independent rules of applying violence What is the just difference? In my view, we have had already since the beginning of using armies for any purposes, a kind of functional differentiation. Some parts of the armies have been tasked with different functions. Functional differentiations in the footsteps of the German socialist Niklas Luhmann can be exemplified by the organs of a body. My heart neither has to tell the liver what to do, nor my brain is telling my lung to breathe. These organs are functioning automat automatically and based on their own rule but they are functioning together and are keeping me alive. True hybridity to the contrary is related to the combination of incompatible actions and structures. And a lot of approaches to counter hybrid warfare, a holistic approach is advocated. Holism is related to the concept of the whole, which integrates the parts in a comprehensive, comprehensive system. Such a kind of holism could not be exercised in a hierarchical sequence, but, but only by an overarching political purpose, as we can witness in partisan warfare. Partisans are political soldiers. The future is really, in my view, hybrid warfare. The task is, in my view, integrating linear and nonlinear kinds of thinking. Um, in the theory of economics, we find um, the idea of non-linearity, but integrated into a kind of sinus curve. 
But let us look at a vivid example. Um, it is the Ooda loop of uh, John Boyd. And here you can see the attempt to integrate political purpose with thinking in circles. Thinking in circles in the Ooda loop is the most advanced strategy at present. Let us look a little bit deeper into uh, hybridity. By debating the concept of hybrid war, we should not fall into the trap of claiming that the Russians and especially General Gerasimov invest, invented it, whereas the Russians say the West is doing it. And Frank Hoffman got us claiming that the Russians do it. Hybrid war and even hybrid warfare is not a doctrine. To treat hybrid threats, conflicts, and warfare only as a technical or tactical is issue would miss the main point. <laughs> hybrid war is a political and strategic challenge in the first place. It is related to the combination of regular as well as irregular, and especially of linear and nonlinear approaches in the, is a main criteria of its nature. So I would like to dig deeper to the question, what has changed to such a degree that now we are able and perhaps forced to recognize that all war is a kind of hybrid. In my view, there are two reasons. One is related to technological revolutions, the other to political and social transformations. Although both are related to one another, I think we must treat them separately. First, I would argue that in hybrid war, the time frame of action has dramatically accelerated. Already Paul Virilio and in Germany, Hartmut Rosa has put emphasis on this acceleration, which leads to the impression of simultaneous action and counteraction. Whereas Clausewitz recommended a clear succession of action and military campaigns, this kind of sequence is questioned when you are attacked or confronted with simultaneous actions. Countering hyper threats, therefore, should not be related to symmetrical counteraction, but to asymmetrical counteraction by reinducing a kind of sequence. Second, if the assessment concerning the acceleration to nearly simultaneously, simultaneousness is right, and the distinguishing lines between past, present, and future are blurred, for example, concerning the traditional understanding of a beginning of the hostilities by a war declaration and an ending in a peace accord, or at least an armistice, these differences no longer exist in hybrid warfare. In the end, hybrid warfare is also blurring the lines between various domains of action. Air, land, sea, communication, communicative domains, cyberspace, outer space, artificial intelligence. This kind of hybridity is related to the extension of domains of action and mainly to the blurring of lines between them. The problem is drawing on borders between the social spheres is a way in which Western thinking of order is based. A vivid example of this problem is embodied in the already existing concept of exist extended security. Third, I think that we are also not yet fully aware of the consequences related to artificial intelligence. Because hitherto we distinguished ourselves as a species from animals by arguing that we are intelligent 
rational and sometimes even reasonable. Now we must accept that we are basically hybrids and our world being different from animals because we are to a certain degree rational, we are also different from artificial intelligence because we are just animals with emotions, feelings, intuitions, and sometimes irrational behavior. The last two, but Perhaps even more important criteria are related to social transformation, which is on one side the rise of the other, as Zakaria has labeled it. The newly rise of the former great empires and civilizations, which have dissolved in the wake of European colonization and the subsequent American hegemony especially the countries at the shores of the North Pacific, mainly but not exclusively China, Japan, and Russia, but of course also India. Here I am partially agreeing with Dominic Moisey in his assessment that the West is terrified by fear about the loss of the sense to be superior to all others. The Islamic world is filled with despair and the people in East Asia are bursting of hope for a better life. On the other side, we are witnessing the dissolution of identities on a communal as well as an individual level. Through the process which I would label in the footsteps of the concept of liquid modernity put forward by Sigmund Bauman as liquid globalization. This development is contributing to the dissolution of the social fabric and cohesion, not only of the Western societies, but worldwide. The apparent counter reaction to these social transformation are either the reinvention of age old identities which are so old that they are supposed to outdo the current accelerated social transformation. And these are religion, race, and perhaps the oldest one, gender. Or the revolt of the millions of youth who lost faith in the social order and promises of their father generation. But what is clear in my view is that conflicts about identity and recognition will increase as a direct result of the dissolution of identities due to the process of liquid globalization. The evolving hybrid wars are demanding to think in circles instead of linear progress. And the theory of economics, the thinking in Kijijois of circles, booms, recessions, and depressions are commonplace. And I have, as I already have mentioned in military affairs, we have already the attempt to combine mm -hmm. purpose with thinking in Kijijois of circles in the approach of John Boyd. In my view, what is missing in the, these attempts in remote and fifth generation warfare as a political purpose. The paradox is in order to construct strategies for any political purpose in democracies, exactly the interdependence with the political purpose is being lost. Here, the lectures or clauses about small wars are of little help. Because in these lectures, he treated small war just as a complement to state to state wars in the concept of functional differentiation. Even if you could accept that war and warfare is always a hybrid, it is easier said than done how to conduct or even counter hybrid warfare. 
I'm tempted to think that also authoritarian states or dictatorships are more capable of exercising hybrid warfare because they could integrate the conflicting tendencies of hybridity by relying on a kind of Führer, a paramount leader like Putin or Xi. Here, we could also not rely on Clausewitz because in most parts of on war, he tried to generalize just one single strategy, that of Napoleon. Besides book six, he did not combine various strategy. But I would argue that there are two approaches which could be used for current warfare. First, the dialectics of defense and offense or self-preservation and self-transgression. Because Clausewitz is arguing that defense is a stronger form of war with a negative purpose and offense a weaker form of war with a positive purpose. This concept is not a binary code of either or, but is enabling to concentrate on the dynamics of war, the transition from one pole to the other, the lines of gravitation instead of one center of gravitation, which does not exist anymore in hybrid warfare. We could visualize this dialectic with a sinus curve erected on an enhancing x-axis. And I have learned from my colleagues in mathematics that there is a mathematical description of this model. There is a very old argument concerning the problem whether you need to stick to plans and rules in warfare or whether after the first shot, Every plan is no longer worth worthy. I think we need to think differently. We need to think in categories of waves instead of linear hierarchies. A tsunami is consisting just of fluid water, but it could be destructive and has a lot of power. The second proposition I would like to put forward by thinking with Clausewitz beyond Clausewitz is a political soldier or the democratic warrior. At first sight, the democratic warrior has just experienced his Waterloo in Afghanistan. But we should not abandon this concept lightheartedly. If there is a relation between the political purpose of war and the conduct of war, we need to relate warfare to the political purpose of democracies. To what else? Of course, it would be a contradiction in itself to impose democratic self-determination self by imposing it from the outside. And I have learned from uh, your homepage that you have just published an article about the separation of the military and the democratic leadership. I would agree with this uh, article but I think in a globalized world, we need to relate the soldiers, the warriors much more to the democratic values. In my view, hybrid warfare, hybrid globalization is demanding the hybrid soldier who is acting in between democracy, republicanism, and a warrior ethos. It is not impossible to construct such a kind of balance. The whole of our legal systems are based on such a balance, 
as has been exemplified since very, very old times as a statue of justice. So I think we need to develop a discourse about the question for what purpose we should send our troops in battles. What can we achieve with it and how could we measure a realistic success in the long run? To be clear, in my view, the power doctrine is not as such wrong, but it is also missing an overarching political purpose. At the beginning of On War, Clausewitz is beginning his elaboration with the definition that war is an act of force to compel our enemy to do our will. I think that this definition is right, but incomplete. In book six, Clausewitz is arguing that war is not beginning with the attack, but with the defense. Attack has a purpose to conquer, to achieve something. In contrast, the immediate purpose of defense is resistance, is fighting to annihilate the purpose of the attacker. So Clausewitz is essential saying that war is starting in the moment in which someone is fighting in order not to do the will of your opponent. So I would like to um, add to Clausewitz's definition the idea, war is an act of force, not to be compelled, compelled to do the will of your, enemy, of your enemy. In short, for democracies, war is an act of force to defend democratic self-determination. The task between, beyond Clausewitz thinking. First, combining the stronger form of defense with the purpose the positive purpose of attack. And second, the task is to conduct a limited warfare in a borderless world. Such a perspective would have been unthinkable for Clausewitz. Although he highlighted the dual nature of war in short, limited and unlimited warfare, he directly related limited warfare to limited political purpose and unlimited warfare to unlimited political circumstances. As he highlights in his analysis of the success of the French revolutionary armies. I'm aware of the problem of artificial intelligence, but I'm not an expert concerning this subject. From a Clausewitzian point of view, sorry, I have a little code. <laughs> I would nevertheless argue that we need um, to remain skeptical concerning the temptations of solving political problems by more advanced technologies. Perhaps that was a temptation of the revolution in military affairs, understood in a very broad sense. I remember enthusiastic commentaries in Israel after the quick victory about the armies of Saddam Hussein in 2003. As we should know today, we need much more cultural knowledge than just the most advanced technology. In ethics, we find the saying that morality is the price we have to, we have to pay for modernity. Clausewitz in the 21st century, my last two uh, slides. The relation of the political purpose and warfare has, in my view, not changed. 
What has changed is the understanding of policy and politics and the function of war in a globalized world. Clausewitz is, in my view, the theoretician of warfare, not the legitimacy of war. And he is uh, the theoretician of analyz analyzing the dynamics in warfare. Clausewitz formulated, in my view, the right questions and concepts, but we need to find new answers. But as his legacy, we can start by highlighting the Trinity and the dialectics of defense and offense or attack. Thank you for your patience. Uh, I hope it was a little bit understandable. I'm open for all your questions and suggestions. Thank you, Andreas. It's been that was an excellent uh, exposition. And uh, coming from uh, a person who's extremely uh, well uh, versed <laughs> in politics and understanding of philosophy as well uh, is a, a very very important uh, input that we appreciate very well. So let me uh, uh, you know open the floor for questions before uh, and you know asking. Uh, people with their questions. The, there is a methodology that we will follow. Uh, individuals can raise their uh, hand through using the uh, 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 the uh, provisions available at the bottom. And uh, you can also project your uh, questions through the chat mode as well. And uh, let me start with uh, my privilege of asking the first few questions to Andreas. Well, uh, Politics uh, is the policy, is the, you know, primacy of policy is something um, and that has been consistently expressed with respect to Clausewitz in dictum. And uh, in the context of, as you pointed out in one of your slides, I think out of the four uh, assertions of different, uh, you know, experts and scholars on US failure or US withdrawal from Afghanistan, I think the only one that probably resonates with me is the failure or the lack of clear political objectives. So when we actually relate to what's happened now with respect to uh, what the US is going through, uh, or what the US has done over the last 70 years, whether it's Korean War, whether it's Vietnam War, or the war in Iraq, both in 91 and 2003, and now in Afghanistan, and of course, the involvement in Syria and, and Libya, et cetera. Uh, are we missing something in terms of uh, Hegemon's political purpose that defines uh, their in interventions and interactions in these places? From a Clausewitz in perspective. Andreas, yes. Um, I have to admit that I'm not an expert concerning um, these questions. My main problem is the relation of policy and culture. Um, I think from a Western point of view, of course, democracy is the ultimate goal. But I think that uh, we need to take more aspects uh, into account. Um, and Concerning Afghanistan, I really think that there um, might have been a different out outcome if the US would more relied on the uh, power doctrine and not on an infinite war on terror. So I think I'm not sure whether there might have been a different outcome. I, as I mentioned, I would not like to be viewed as a sofa at my all. Perhaps this is an incomplete or insufficient answer, but I would not like to give um, a premature uh, answer. Yeah, okay, fine. So uh, one of the uh, observations that I 
personally made is that the US military, particularly the US Air Force, studies prospects quite extensively. And, uh, but from the implementation of, uh, you know, or the prosecution of various wars, I think as you listed out, uh, you know, Colin Powell's, uh, you know, the statements, uh, the emphasis in US way of war has been extraordinarily focused on uh, overwhelming firepower and overwhelming force application. And there, as you, you know, mentioned some time back, the linkage to politics and culture has been significantly missing in all their involvements of Vegas war. And, and uh, is that a significant deficiency in the context of US the politics and culture that prevails in the US? Or is it a deliberate uh, methodology that a hegemon follows? I really think that uh, the revolution in military affairs uh, was a temptation to solve political moral problems with uh, more advanced techniques. And I think this, um, uh, this approach has failed. There's a saying, of course, you know it, that uh, the Taliban has said that the NATO has the watches and they have the time. Uh, but I really think that uh, in the Western world, we have a different time frame that uh, in most other civilizations. Um, for example, in uh, China, uh, there's an attempt of combining modern, the most modern technology with a very old concept of Confucius. Of Confucius. Um, so, the task for the 21st century is to uh, enable the rise of the formerly great civilizations or the great civilizations of the earth without um, falling in the trap of idolizing a past which did not exist as for example, IS or Salafism. Uh, is highlighting. So um, I think that uh, with the victory of victory of the Taliban, uh, the Western model and the attempt that the whole world should ab apply and amend to the Western concepts of society, uh, this has ended finally. Uh, Thank you. Okay, uh, let me uh, just ask one more question before I open up to the others. Uh, uh, you emphasize from Kauswitz's emphasis on offense, I mean, defense as against offense, which is actually a very important uh, issue. But the net result from all case, uh, further up to the end of the Second World War, has been completely the opposite with uh, excessive aggression and excessive offense. On the other hand, do the Chinese? Uh, are the Chinese more defense oriented in the context of Sun Tzu's influence and their overall strategy and as it evolves while technology, they're leapfrogging the technology, but are they more focused on strong defense as against defense? Um, concerning the Chinese, I'm uh, really not sure because um, with their uh, concept of the new Silk Road, they are uh, pursuing a kind of um, change of developing their own kind of world order. Uh, so I would say this is a kind of uh, offense, but at present, they are no, not yet a match for the US Army. But as I have already um, witnessed in 2015 in a conference in Tokyo, an army general of uh, US Marines said um, in 2030, there will be a match of the US. At present, they are more relying on the asymmetry of the fight and on the stronger form of defense. But I don't, I'm not 
sure whether the policy pursued by Xi Jinping, which uh, is um, or which has a more aggressive posture, will also result in a more aggressive kind of military strategy. Thank you. Okay, let me uh, raise uh, you know the questions put up by a few of our audience. Uh, Before uh, I'm ask, um, answering more questions, I would uh, I, I need to um, excuse in advance because the um, perhaps I could not understand every question if and if I don't answer appropriately, just be be open to say it. No problem. That's true. Uh, Colonel Gautam, sir, you want to ask the question directly or you want me to read it up? Chat box, chat box. Okay. Uh, so, Colonel Gautam's question is your, uh, Professor Andreas, your views on nature of war, unchanging and character of war, changing character of war. I have to think about it. One moment. I'm just looking in the chat. Um, the changing character of war um, is, in my view, not so much related to technological developments, but to what I would label, what I have. Um, try to develop in the concept of liquid globalization. So uh, as I have highlighted in, I think in the last but one slide is that the problem for today is how to conduct limited warfare in an unlimited environment. Um, for democracies, with the exception of the war against the German Nazis, uh, they are only able to conduct limited warfare. Uh, but the change in our times really is that we have a borderless environment. And the problem is, in my view, how to conduct successfully limited warfare in an unlimited environment. For example, uh, videos or handies or whatsoever are um, just transforming uh, the view of war. One example was from, for me that after the war between Hezbollah and Israel in 2006, both sides claimed victory. Uh, because Hezbollah in their view, because they have not been defeated. In Israel, because in their view, they have um, conducted a successful campaign. So we have to accept that the discourse about war is much more counting that um, the result on the ground. So with the new technologies, with Google and Facebook and so on, I think that the new uh, challenge is um, that war is integrated much more than formally into a discourse about war. The other question is, Character. Uh, as I could see the difference between Spencer and Clausewitz strategic thinking. I, I believe, um, perhaps as a Clausewitz, as I, I have to say this, uh, that uh, Sun Tzu Spencer lived in an age of never ending civil wars. <laughs> he um, proposed a kind of warfare um, with his famous dictum that really uh, victory is if you don't need to fight. Because even if you uh, ha um, have succeeded, you have been weakened by the fight and have 
might have have no chance against the next um, opponent. So in my view, Spencer was not interested in shaping the political conditions after the war. But this is the main aspect in Clausewitz. Perhaps Claus uh, Spencer is more successful concerning strategies, whereas uh, Clausewitz is uh, being need to Clausewitz much more in shaping the political con conditions after the war. If that was uh, really the, you know, what you explained is that, you know, uh, people had understood very well, then why has the, you know, like Joe Biden uh, just said after the withdrawal from Afghanistan, that our job was not nation building in Afghanistan, it was only to sort out the terrorist attack on 9-11-2001, I mean 2000, and uh, you don't need 20 years of involvement subsequently to demolish whatever terrorist, uh, you know, capability that existed and still go <coughs> back to them. So where does the serious shortfall in, in that context that you experience? I have to think about it. Sorry for um, hesitating to answer it. Um, I don't think that the US really was interested in transforming societies. They worked together with warlords, uh, which might be useful in cases of defeating the enemy, but uh, by relying on different warlords and local resistance and so on. I think that um, they only half-heartedly uh, try to transform Afghan society. For example, we have different kinds of counterinsurgency and postmodern counterinsurgency is related to have proxies on the ground. So the problem is, I hope I'm not uh, tempted to argue as a software admiral, but the problem is when you are relying, are relying on proxies on the ground, you are dividing society. And I think this is really the problem in another example um, where I'm perhaps much more um, versed. This is in the uh, Mali and Niger and Nigeria. Uh, in all these cases, the intervention forces have been relying on proxies on the ground. But in all these cases, these led to a kind of fragmented society. And uh, if you have a fragmented society, you have no chance of transforming the whole of society. You have no chance of uh, enabling democ democratic self-determination if you are dividing society as such. And I think this was a problem in Afghanistan too. Yeah, that's true. I mean, the fragmentation and the divisions that exist in that uh, society and population is, I think, beyond. And, and throughout history, I think most uh, colonial powers and imperialists have failed significantly. And I don't think the story is any different uh, with the Americans as well. Uh, there is another question now for, from Air Marshal Noah. Timmy, sir, would you like to ask or you want me to read up? Uh, you go ahead. Just ask for the chat box. Okay. So today, war has become an excuse to keep the military industrial complex thriving. And this was not the case when Clausewitz wrote on war. Do you think Clausewitz missed this thought while talking about war is a continuation of policy by other means? Or is this exactly what he meant? And uh, linked to that, I think there's enough, uh, you know, uh, discussions and statements that come out that link the American involvement in Iraq and uh, Afghanistan to the combination of military industrial complex, the pharmaceutical industry and the big tech. So what do you think about that? And the, with this 
Um, I think this is a, a deeply uh, political question concerning the military industrial complex. Um, I think Clausewitz missed this point, of course, because in his time, uh, we have a kind of uh, militarist society, uh, a society of nobilities, and at the same time, he witnessed uh, the French Revolution and the French Revolutionary Army. I think this was really not a question for Clausewitz. Uh, if you, um, if I would give my personal opinion. Um, which is not um, a scientific-based uh, approach, I think you are right. There are, for example, um, a lot of military, a lot of um, private contractors in uh, the Middle East, which have been uh, the remnants, remnants of the wars in Chechnya, remnants of the force in Yugoslavia, remnants of the for, uh, war in Libya. And these uh, soldiers are wandering from one war, um, war place to the other. Concerning the military industrial complex, I have different um, I'm not sure. On one side, we, we need um, industry to compete with, for example, China. And it would not be useful to say, okay, the Chinese will not attack us. <laughs> so we need planes and uh, tanks and so on. On the other side, um, I can understand your question uh, that um, these powerful industry have their own interests of, on war. Uh, so I would say we have a tension. On one side, we need those industries, of course. On the other side, it is sometimes very hard to control them. Uh, here's another question from Christian Doberger. Does the Chinese military really aim of being stronger than the US military? Or is it enough for them to dominate the strategic area, ban CNA, around China, which would include to restrict US abilities to the so-called island chain? Such an interpretation could maybe interpreted as an emphasis on defense instead of an emphasis on attack. What is your opinion on that? I think this is what I've uh, been trying to answer some minutes ago. At present, uh, what Christian Kloberger, <laughs> well, Christian Kloberger uh, has labeled the defensive strategy of uh, the Chinese at present. But I'm not sure whether they will be in 10 years still relying on this uh, defensive strategy. And I think with uh, the attempt to dominate world order, they will also uh, try to change the strategy. I fear so. Hmm. Uh, the few other questions that I have here, uh, uh, Andres, uh, you know, we are at a time when right wing politics, this come, brings us to the you know, aspect of politics, both domestic and international. And uh, at a time when types of right-wing and national-centric uh, populist culture, how will the Clausewitz in view interpret the interdependence between civic lives, states, and its military as well as strategic assets? I think, um... We have to differentiate between um, various understandings of policy or politics. Uh, in democracy, of course, we have the primacy of uh, civil society above the military. Uh, 
But politics is not just uh, the primacy of the civilian control about uh, above or about the military. Uh, we have, and here I would oppose the article in the Peninsula Foundation about uh, the relation of uh, the civil the civil military relations. Um, sometimes I have the impression that the civilians in the Pentagon in Washington are much more militaristic than the U.S. than the U.S. generals, because the generals know much more about the hardship and the sufferings in war. So, um, in the article in the Peninsula Foundation, it was uh, said that General Miley, I think, um, didn't want to be employed in politics. But in fact, he said that his aim was to defend the constitution. So I think that this is a different um, relation of policy and politics uh, with relation to the military. We, in my view, we need a direct relation between the democratic constitution and the military. Not um, the political leadership and the military. These, uh, their purposes and their aim might be different, but I think we need to relate directly the military to the political constitution. And I think really that we need the political soldier. Um, because in a globalized world, in um, hybrid warfare, we cannot separate any more policy directly from military thinking. So I think in a globalized world, in a hybrid world, hybrid globalization, we need to reconnect um, the military to the political constitution or the political democratic basis. Absolutely, yeah. right. I think uh, what you said is extremely relevant. The concept of the military while in service being absolutely loyal to the constitution is extremely important. But at the same time, uh, you know, this is also a lot of concern has been expressed in the US in the last, uh, I would say, a decade plus, particularly within the context of having moved out from, uh, you know, uh, conscription to a full volunteer military. Uh, the tendency or the domination of, of the civil uh, non-military experience representation in the political decision-making arena, particularly in the Congress, was seen as a problem. And in, in India, it is pretty much given uh, as uh, unwritten, you know, a fact that most, uh, almost all political leaders have uh, little or no military background or military experience. Uh, so isn't it important that once the, the military uh, role or the military service is over for an individual. It is equally important for individuals to be involved in the political process. Given the kind of uh, Russian and German history that you've gone through, how do you think this question? Uh, oh. Of course, I'm rely relying again on Clausewitz. There was a um, dispute about one passage uh, change from the first edition of On War and the second edition, because the second edition, um, the brother of his wife changed an important um, sentence. Uh, Clausewitz in the first uh, edition has said that the military leaders, the military uh, the officers, the generals need to be part of uh, the cabinet in order that the uh, 
um, political decisions were made on a, um, a knowledge were made on a basis that the politicians know what they are doing. In the second edition, uh, this turned a little bit and um, Count Brühl, the brother of his wife, uh, has transformed the sentence in the way that uh, the military should transform and change and um, the political uh, situation by themselves. So uh, perhaps it is a little bit idealistic, but I would really say that uh, in my concept of the democratic war, yeah, we have three aspects. Democracy, a warrior ethos, ethos, and republicanism. And in my view, we have in our democracies two aspects always, democracy and republic. For example, the uh, state in which I am living is not called the democratic Germany, but the republic Germany. And also the US is a republic, not so much a democracy in my view, at least. So we need to uh, develop a kind of republicanism, a kind of republic discourse, which is able to mediate democratic majority and a kind of warrior identity. That's true. Uh, in the same context, uh, you know, uh, during Clausewitz's uh, uh, time and this, uh, you know, environment uh, was also a period of rising uh, nationalism, right? I mean, yes. Over Molke's, uh, you know, influence of Clausewitz on Molke as Bismarck and Molke ran through to create the unified Germany. So was Napoleon's uh, wars that Clausewitz witnessed and participated in. And Napoleon was the man who actually started off in slogan, maybe en masse in the, in the Grand Army. Uh, all that goes back to actually the European concept of uh, you know, states, the Westphalian territorial state, which is at the uh, core of the two world wars that we uh, fought. The, both the wars are actually European wars. And America, of course, uh, yeah came in in a big way in the Second World War. But the world that's come after 1945 and today in the 21st century uh, is a sort of an imitation of the state system that created some of the problems in the Europe. They're territorially conscious and uh, I would say a very narrow-minded nationalism that drives the development of military ethos as well as uh, political you know, orientation of most of the states. And that is, if you really historically analyze, as you mentioned about civilization and backgrounds of Asian states, if you dig deep into it, you'll find there's a lot of anomalies in the state's creations. And uh, this is one of the fundamental problems of continuing small scale wars in most regions, uh, which is, you know, the state gets uh, uh, underconfident of retaining its territorial integrity. And, uh, but it does not meet the aspirations of various segments of its population. So how do you think that's going to match with Clausewitzian, uh, you know, concept of, you know, uh, national armies or, you know, being um, you're literally uh, educated to uh, defend the territorial integrity? Is there a mismatch between that and what is evolving in a globalized world in the 21st century? Um. I think that we need to uh, think with Clausewitz beyond Clausewitz. And of course, some of uh, his assessments are related to the European state of his own time. In my view, what you are implying is a very important problem that the European Westphalian state is uh, constructed um, which with the basis of society consisting of uh, individuals. In most other non-Western states, we have not a relation of the state and individual, 
but the state is um, a kind of community of communities, not of individuals. And I really think that the uh, paradigm of Thomas Hobbes could not be applied to non-Western states. Here, I think uh, that uh, this is perhaps uh, really theory, but I think it is true. Here, we need to think in categories of um, Carl Schmitt, because Carl Schmitt would say that if a state is dissolving, a dictatorship is dissolving, we don't have individuals, but there is a there are a lot of groups which are fighting against one another. For example, in Colombia after the Civil War, we did not have we did not get democracy, but uh, the fighting of youth gangs against one another. The same is true with uh, Iraq after the war. We did not get a perfect democracy with individuals and a function state, but uh, the state is dissolving into smaller communities which are fighting against each, each other. So in my view, uh, what we are witnessing with so-called failed states, what we are witnessing if a dictatorship is um, falling apart is not a direct uh, transformation into democracies. And this is, in my view, the main fault of Western thinking concerning Iraq and Afghanistan. The uh, approach was to think that with um, Saddam Hussein being gone, we only need to uh, fight against the dictator and then uh, perfect democracy would evolve automatically. Reality was that after deposing the dictator, the society was falling apart into small communities. And this is um, a different approach and I really think that um, in the non-Western world, we need to find a kind, in my view, of democracy, which is more related to a community of communities than um, that of a state and individuals. Perhaps, um, a further difference is that in the Westphalian system of the European states, the state is of paramount importance. Whereas, for example, in the Islamic Arabic world, society is more important, not the state. Um, and I think this was also true with communism. There's a different kind of thinking, whether the state is at the center or society. I think society should be logically. So perhaps we need to democratize society first, because before in enabling a political democracy, because Without a democratic society, more or less, based on equal rights, mm. uh, political democracy must fail. Mm. That's interesting. Perhaps this is, a, this is too strong a thesis, but uh, <laughs> I'm trying just to ask, answer your questions. Thank you, uh, Dr. Andrea. That's been wonderful. We are coming to the end of our. Uh, Session. There are quite a few young uh, research scholars with us. Uh, any of you want to ask a question? Uh, Joseph or Nadula uh, Rupal, please, uh, the last uh, questions you can raise. Otherwise, we'll be coming to the end of the session. Or anyone else who wants to ask a question? Admiral Srikandi, he teaches prospects. Not this one? Yes, go ahead. 
uh, about artificial intelligence uh, is professor meaning the human agency because ai will take over the consciousness so is that is concern because in my research also that is my concern the human aspect because science doesn't know ethics ethics is known to humans so the future of ai and warfare uh, just uh, short view because i'm researching on this yeah professor andres mm. As I already mentioned, I'm not an, an expert in this and you are much more versed in this. But I think from, um, because I'm teaching also ethics, uh, I think that morality is a price of modernity. Uh, for a long time, we have um, assumed that we could um, solve political and moral problems with technological advancements, advancement. And in all kinds of our uh, world, we have to accept that uh, moral problems are not dissolving, but are uh, posed on a higher level. So I think with artificial intelligence, we have to think about what we are as humans. And I think that is uh, a question which is far reaching uh, beyond just military strategies. I think um, that Kant, now I'm the philosopher, that Kant has asked four basic questions. What I, what am I? What can I know? What can I hope? And what should I do? And now we have to ask the questions, what is humankind? What should we do as humans? What should we strive for? So perhaps I'm a little bit old, <laughs> but, uh, in my view, uh, we need to recognize that in a globalized world, uh, we have to um, conduct a discourse, what we are, what should we do as humankind, no longer as states of Europeans as I am, or Germans whatsoever, but uh, what is reason reason in my view we think is the thinking of humankind about itself uh, thank you uh, professor andreas uh, a couple of uh, observations uh, in terms of which is very you know uh, close to me is is your reference to john boyd's woodal loop and i think uh, i fully agree with you it's uh, it's a fascinating uh, you know, uh, theory or a strategy or observation as John Boyd himself says, in terms of uh, destruction and creation, uh, it has a lot of relevance. And uh, your model that you actually displayed uh, subsequently on, on the uh, floating balance model is extremely interesting as well. And, and something that we would like to get into it in more detail. Uh, we've come to the end of uh, today's uh, session. And I must thank you for this wonderful you know, exposition and the great interaction that we've had. We hope to have more uh, in the future uh, and look forward to having you hosting your game at the Peninsula Foundation. So on behalf of all of us here today and at the Peninsula Foundation, let me thank you profusely. And thank you. I have, to, once again. I have to thank you for the invitation for your questions. I have to apologize if I was not able to answer appropriately, perhaps due to the um, communication problems, because you are in India, I am in Germany. <laughs> but oh, perhaps you know, if, fine. Yeah, great. Yeah. but perhaps if uh, COVID will finally end next year, I would be honored to come to Chennai sometime because uh, I uh, appreciate it and your assistance and your invitation. Thank you. Yeah, we certainly look forward to that. And we do hope everything opens up next year. Okay. Thank you.
and by uh, one sec i'll uh, rupal will do the what are thanks rupal are you there uh, yes sir please go ahead uh, it's me immense pleasure to give the board of thanks on behalf of the parents of the foundation for this uh, extremely insightful lecture and we thank uh, professor ontrius for accepting our invitation despite his extremely busy schedule and uh, i also thank ai marshall and mathishan for sharing this meeting and the audience members for their questions and i'm sure that all of us have benefited immensely from this discussion on crosswords and we once again thank you professor and uh, we hope to see you again soon thank you Thank you. Thank you. This is Anna.